political correspondent over there at The Spectator. James Hill is, Hill is with us. James, good afternoon to you. Afternoon, Ian. Nice to have you with us. Um, I mean, it's interesting, the manifesto thing. I, they're not legally binding, of course. They're, um, what are they, a, a, a direction of travel, an aspiration list? What's the, well, what do we make of a manifesto? And I wonder how many people even read them. Well, Ken Clark always used to joke that uh, he would always go occasionally through the manifesto and discover all sorts of exciting things he never knew he'd promised to pledge and implement. Um, you know, they're often described as sort of, uh, you know, documents only for about a handful of people in Westminster. But really, they're a kind of sort of, as you say, a sort of a programme for government, a statement of priorities, uh, a kind of amuse-bouche for the main course of uh, government. And really, I think you can learn a lot about what people are discussing. And as you said, crucially at the outset, what they aren't discussing. And particularly with some of those issues coming down the track, like things like assisted dying, things which could end up dominating the next parliament sure. we're not actually talking about at all. Indeed. Well, let's have a listen, a reminder of this is a clip of Starmer, Sunak and Farage launching their manifestos at the start of the election campaign. The very foundation of any good government is economic security, border security, national security. And make no mistake, if the British people give us the opportunity to serve, then this is their core test. Our plan is clear. We will halve migration as we have halved inflation and then reduce it every single year. Our aim and our ambition is to establish a bridgehead in Parliament and to become a real opposition to a Labour government. So there it is, James. I mean, that's the, again, it's all about mood music. I understand that. They can't mention in, in those moments every single policy they want to deal with. But there are some howlers there, and I would imagine that the omission of, you know, crime, for example, you know, there's very little on police numbers, uh, prisons and all that goes with it. These are not insignificant areas of policy. No, and I think that there's a real likelihood of a prison crisis under the next government, whoever that may yeah. choose to be. I think the issue as well, of course, is that, uh, you know, you see other countries around the world which are seeing a sort of ways in which to reduce crime. You know, by talking about prison places, etc., you've got El Salvador, for instance. Uh, why hasn't that really featured much? And I think it's because, actually, there's a lot of consensus on these issues. And you really think maybe reform would have chosen to talk about it. But other than migration, they haven't really been trying to smash up the consensus or status quo at all, really. Yeah, I wonder whether the next government, I mean, this largely goes into a, a slightly different point, James, but, you know, we, we constantly keep hearing from the Conservatives that we're, you know, we're coming out the woods now, stay with us because we're on a journey and it's looking pretty good. Uh, economy is making a recovery. Uh, inflation has been halved. Nothing, as we know, really to do with the government of the day in that respect. Um, and, of course, we'll deal with immigration, they say. So stick with us. This thing is working. But there's a lot of voices out there at the moment that actually say we're not really out of anything right now. And the next year or two could be equally tricky as the previous two. Yeah, I think there's different moods about this. So I think we're probably through the worst of it, um, but I do think that, you know, it's tough decisions to come down on the economy. We've also, of course, even got some big bills to pay. We've got uh, tainted blood, about 10 billion on that. We've got the post office inquiry, lots of things coming down the track. And I think that it's going to be a very difficult time, whoever gets in. The key thing, of course, is that, uh, you know, an election wouldn't give you a new democratic mandate, so you have the power to do these things. And the hopeful aim will be that taking tough decisions, if they get in on Thursday, will be years one and two. They will pay off in years four and five. And that's what you typically tend to do make the tricky decisions at the start of a parliament yep. so you can win the election two years down the line that is the idea let's move to another story britain's defense forces are not ready for conflict of any scale according to one senior official this is of course an area that again doesn't always get the biggest headlines but it does divide the room when it comes to how different political parties are promising to deal with it here's keir starmer speaking on how defense is so important and our security absolutely central Within the first year of a Labour government, we will carry out a new strategic defence review. We are absolutely committed to spending 2.5% of GDP on defence as soon as possible. Because we know our security isn't just vital for our safety today, it's absolutely central to our success for the future. National security and economic security must go hand in hand. 
It always sounds good, James, doesn't it? If you use the word strategic and review, a strategic defence review, you think, wow, these guys are really onto it here. Um, I, I, I don't, that, that probably means sitting in a room somewhere and having a chat and, and writing a pamphlet or some kind of release. Uh, they're talking about 2.5. I think reform are promising 3% uh, of, of GDP, upping it uh, a little. I can see why they've done that. But it is rather worrying when those that are experts in this area, and this assessment is pretty grim when it says we're just simply not ready to fight conflict of any scale. Uh, absolutely, and I think it shows it's an indictment of kind of the post-Cold War consensus we've had. You know, for 30 years we had the peace dividend, people thought we could cut back endlessly on our forces, we thought we'd be in a world of continued globalisation and sunny optimism, and right now what do we see? We see China on the rise in the east, we see Russia invading Ukraine, all sorts of hostile threats growing by the day, and I think right now the chickens have come home to roost stand on the Conservative watch as it were. So the Conservatives, they've got a big story this week, they're trying to attack Labour on the fence, you know, Sunak saying Putin is watching the Kremlin. At Actually, I think this is a weak spot for them because they've cut troops back and back by 30,000 over the past 10 years. Yeah, and I do wonder wh whether this area it isn't talked about in, in kind of very high profile. It doesn't come up in those debates in any big way uh, because maybe it really doesn't pass the interest test of the public, even though, you know, when asked, we would all go, well, it's clearly very, very important, but uh, it's not something necessarily people think about when they kick their quilt off the bed in the morning. Yeah, I think that it can be an important factor when there's a lot of clear blue water there. So I think 2019, the defence of the realm was a bigger issue because Corbyn, you know, clearly wanted to get yeah. rid of the nuclear bomb, would have had a very different style of armed forces. So it was more of an issue there. It's a testament to how much work Labour's done to kind of neutralise this as an issue. And you, you, Starmer's been very strong on Ukraine, which I think is admirable. Mm. But as you say, Ian, it's one of those issues which probably should get more, you know, scrutiny, given that it is literally the defence of the realm and all our livelihoods are at stake there. I wonder what it's going to be, you know, all these new ministers that are going to send it and and uh, secretaries of state that will be appointed over the days assuming uh, Starmer wins. Uh, people with, with no experience at all of government will suddenly find themselves in impressive Whitehall buildings being met by a permanent secretary. There's always that polite round of applause as they walk in and welcome Secretary of State. There's all of that bit going on and then they're taken into a room and as one um, previous Home Secretary said to me, you are essentially read a very um, not so much the riot act, but you're sort of given a very big reality check quite soon on that despite your impressive title, despite the sort of heady veneer of authority, there are limitations to what you can do. And here's a big old list. I think Michael Howard once said he was told when he went into the Home Office, they showed him a big old chart of crime and, and it was going up this area and up there. And the permanent secretary said, and the thing you need to know, Home Secretary, is absolutely nothing you can do about it. So there are clear areas that they wouldn't say out loud, but it's not a straightforward job. And I would imagine in defence that becomes as tricky as anywhere else. Yes, completely. And, you know, obviously, situational command in the military is for the defence chiefs. Uh, a lot of these things, frankly, are resolved in the Treasury. And the spending rounds are the key thing here. If you hold the purse strings, you control the future of that department. And I think that's what we're going to see over the next two, three years or so, is a lot of divides between, say, Rachel Reeves, if she becomes Chancellor, and the spending department's defence, education, health mm. as well, because the key battle lines for a Labour government are probably the guidelines on which they're going to be judged by the electorate in five years' time. I mean, the only gig you'd want is, you know, culture, media and sport, really, isn't it? I mean, if you wanted a slightly easier life, because right now you'd be at Wimbledon at the weekend, you'd have been at Glastonbury. <laughs> Next Sunday, you'd be at the Euros in Germany. I mean, it, that does come with, oh, quite seriously comes with the territory. And I think most shadows also get, uh, you know, a fairly good wad of tickets coming their way. That's the job for anyone, surely. Yeah, Ministry of Fun. I mean, David Mellor perhaps took the fun a little yeah. too far. He was a uh, minister for, I think it was National Heritage back uh, some 30 years ago. Mm. But yeah, culture, media and sport. One of those briefs where not much can happen or a lot can happen. I think Nadine Dorry certainly had a fair few headlines when she was there and talking about BBC and Channel 4. So uh, I'd, if I was going to be in government, Ian, I'm not saying they should make me appear, but you know, Lord Heal of uh, the culture wouldn't be bad, I'd yeah, say. Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? Yeah, go straight to the House <laughs> of Lords and get a ministerial post that way, as, as distinct from having to do that kind of door-stepping leaflet stuff, which yeah. is... Uh, which is always troublesome, I think. Stay with us, James. James Heal, <clears throat> political correspondent at The Spectator, with us here on Talk.